Unspoiled Network Podcast. This is Unspoiled, the book club, covering The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. In this episode, Money and I talk about a haunted house. We're a little late for Spooktober, but I feel like this is still a spooky time of year. I liked this book. He didn't. Welcome to Unspoiled. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Natasha. And I'm Money. And I really hope that uh, the Overdue Boys don't hear that I just said Spooktober and hit me with a, a copyright infringement lawsuit, since they very specifically TM'd that on the last episode. I feel I feel like a playful, not real copyright fight over Twitter might raise both your brands. <laughs> Oh, um, the cynic over here. Oh, yeah, let's stage a beef. We're like rappers now. That's how podcasts work. East, West Coast, baby. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, this, you know, technically was going to fall within October because I had planned when I started off the year to keep doing all of the book club episodes live on YouTube Live. And, um then a lot of people weren't coming to them and it was a lot of trouble to set up. So I decided that I would just go ahead and record them normally. And so when I plan on doing it live, I wanted to record this on Halloween and I wound up moving that. And, uh, now it is November 4th. (laughs) So technically the season for spookiness is over, but I still feel it. Not necessarily because the internet says that Antifa is, taking over and creating oh, yeah. a coup so i forgot um, about that everybody hide your avocados right so if you're we're coming to you from into your post-apocalyptic wasteland where you <laughs> <laughs> um so this book is really it's lauded as one of like the greatest haunted house books ever written there were two movies made of it um i have not seen the original which i think was made in the 70s it was actually uh, made, I think it was 1961. It was right after the book oh, came out. Okay, cool. And it the more contemporary one is real bad. Real, real bad. I didn't even know that that was like what, the which book that was based on. I didn't know it was based on a book at all. I went to see The Haunting in the theaters when I was probably like 16. And... I was so excited, and I was so disappointed after. I rented <sighs> it and watched it because I worked at a gas station at the time, and I worked the the graveyard shift, so I put it in there. And it's I've never made a movie, but I don't think having Lily Taylor on MDMA is really good for a spooky atmosphere. <laughs> I just, like, it was one of those movies that, like, If you're 16 and easily scared, which I was, and I'm still laughing at you, that's a really bad sign. You just failed. Like, I am your target audience. A a hyperactive imagination teenage girl. And I'm not even scared. I mean, come on. Um, But, oh, yeah. So, when I started reading this, I wasn't aware that it was supposed to that it that that movie had been supposedly based on this book and i use air quotes around that based on um and it was about two chapters in where i was suddenly like wait a second because of the woman's name being eleanor and some of the weirdness about her and theo and i was like i think this sounds familiar and sure enough um continuing so, our tradition of getting most of the way through a book before realizing that you've seen the movie. Yeah, this is how we consume things now, backwards. Um, 
which I think is probably a good thing. Instead of seeing the book first and then going to see the god awful movie, you get you get the bad thing first and then you get to read the better thing. Um, so Shirley Jackson, who wrote this book, also wrote the lottery. Really? Um, she, yes. Um, and she wrote uh, the yellow wallpaper. I think is the name of the other one. Um, and just in general was a really prolific writer and was actually recognized in her own lifetime for being an amazing writer. Um, let's see. I'm trying to find the name of the one. Uh, but the lottery is probably the one that most people know her the best for. Um, yeah, we most, most of us had to read it in high school. so Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And I remember at the time just being so like annoyed by it. Like, it was supposed to be this kind of profound work of fiction about how people don't understand things until it, it happens to them. And I found it really like trite and stupid. And I was just like, Oh, I guess people are just morons. And now that I'm an adult looking at the world, I'm like, Oh no. Yeah. She was right. That I is, just that really is... <laughs> did not give her any credit as a kid. Cause it just seemed so illogical to me. A fair assessment. Yes. Oh God. Um, so she, uh, kind of had a a troubled life and I'm not going to get too far into her biography here because she didn't really like share that much to be honest but she um had a lot of trouble with her health she was really overweight I guess she smoked a lot uh she wasn't really happy in her marriage and her husband like cheated on her a lot and she had a ton of kids (laughs) I think she wound up having like eight kids something like that Um, One more, you have a baseball team. Right, basically. And she wound up dying of heart failure at the age of 48. Wow. Uh, Yeah, so she died really young, and she had written so much in such a short time that you can wonder how much she would have continued to write if she had lived only even 20 more years, you know. Um, And I just find it really impressive that she was able to gain fame and make a living off of her writing while she was alive, especially as a woman who put her own name on things. You know, it's just something that is so rare, I feel like. And kind of, I kind of feel like she's a bit of a badass for that. Um, and The Haunting of Hill House, it was, in, she was inspired to write it by this weird thing that she, that happened where she like, I guess would wake up when she was in a deep sleep and write things down and forget, fall back asleep. And when she woke up, she'd see what she wrote down and have no memory of it. So So this is an, this is an ambient book then. uh, The the book itself. No, but she fell asleep, woke up, wrote down dead, dead twice on a paper in her office. And then went back to sleep completely forgot. Got up in the morning, had breakfast, and then went into her office to work. And there's just a paper on her desk in her own handwriting that just says, dead, dead. And she was like, okay, all right then. And when people ask her about writing this, she says, I had no choice. The ghosts were after me. Which is kind of amazing, okay. to be honest. Um, Are we sure then- she died of heart failure? Because Were there ghosts <laughs> who did something? I mean, they smothered her in her sleep, maybe? Yeah, it's, you're starting to creep me out now. So <laughs> The ghosts were like, she knows too much. Um, yeah, but I really like that because you see that in, in Haunting of Hill House, the idea that somebody might be doing this themselves and just not remembering it. And it's not really confirmed or denied by the end of the book, but it is... This book in general, the whole tone of it was so different than what I expected. I had a lot of kind of, I want to say generational, generation gap here. Okay. And one of the reasons I was a little frustrated with the book is I'm kind of used to horror since the 80s of the Stephen King style. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, where it's not just gross horror and scares, but there's also a mystery to be figured out because the horror itself is a character in your story. And you, in order right. to win, you have to learn their motivations and figure out what they want. I did not feel that here. I never really got a sense for what the house was really up to. Mm-hmm. So, 
That's yeah, that's I why think... I read. I got, I'm super excited about this book when I get to the end, and I'm like, well, what did the house want? And I don't have an answer. So, I think that's really fundamentally probably why I enjoyed it so much, and you didn't, mm-hmm. because I'm so. I don't know if uh, anybody still wants to watch any spooky stuff since Halloween's over, but there was a great series of uh, little vignette, like Halloween vignettes that were put pulled into a cohesive movie on Netflix called Tales of Halloween. Some of them are weird and dumb, but a lot of them are pretty damn good. And there's one particular one where these two men are living across the street from one another and they're competing to decorate for Halloween. But one of them is into the kind of, like, gory, heavy metal type decorations Mm -hmm. where it's, like, really dark. And the other is into very kind of traditional Victorian decorations. I'm the Victorian decorations guy. I don't love horror that has a lot of... um, trauma in it (laughs) like when it gets too emotional it can be draining right and stops being enjoyable for me sometimes and i also really love when for me when you don't know what is going on because there remains this bizarre sense of helplessness if you can't pin down what it is that the ghost wants or what it is that the ghost can do, like if there isn't a really well-defined parameter for its powers or abilities. Um, And sometimes that can be a little bit too open-ended, but most of the time I prefer for things to be pretty nebulous because I find that scarier because then anything can happen. Um, And this book really spoke to me in terms of the exact kind of things that I find scary. Um, I want to just read the opening paragraph. Go for it. uh, Because I just, this first chapter, the first paragraph just grabbed me by the friggin' front of my shirt and was like, ha ha, this is for you. Um, No live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. Even larks and katydids are supposed by some to dream. Hill House, not sane, stood by itself against its hills, holding darkness within. It had stood so for eighty years and might stand for eighty more. Within, walls continued upright, bricks met neatly, floors were firm, and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wood and stone of Hill House, and whatever walked there walked alone. So you just get smacked in the face with, hey, this house is kind of fucked up, like right away. And then you get introduced to Dr. John Montague, who I assumed would be our main character and is not, as it turns out. Um, and this was something like you immediately started messaging me and you were just like, what the hell is this? I, I had so many problems with Dr. Montague. <laughs> All of them stem from his research methods, because Mm -hmm. I was in grad school, and I know how hard it is, not just to get published, but to get the approval to start your research work, even if you're not involving any humans at all. So I was like, okay, your, your experiment here is to find a haunted house and put a bunch of randos in there and write about what happens. No recording equipment whatsoever no control group you yourself are part of the experience i'm like part of the experiment why that's not fair good god no it is not um and that's kind of what delighted me about the 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 rest of this opening uh dr john montague was a doctor of philosophy he had taken his degree in, in anthropology feeling obscurely that in this field he might come closest to his true vocation, the analysis of supernatural manifestations. He was scrupulous about the use of his title because his investigations being so utterly unscientific, he hoped to borrow an air of respectability, even scholarly authority from his education. Yeah. So that's kind of the joke, I think, is just that he is clearly not a scientist. Right. He doesn't take 
he doesn't he acts like he takes this seriously but he doesn't seem to like there's a the air of respectability i guess is really what kind of uh sums it up because he behaves like he wants everybody else to take it seriously but he doesn't seem to be putting anything in place to ensure that the results he's getting are because uh... he he thinks the only thing that matters is his own interpretation of what's going on yeah I and guess that's so. what bugs me about him and he seems like by the end of the book because he tries to like bring his story to a couple people um and it seems like he's surprised that nobody wants to like have anything to do with it and i'm like really dude well i'm glad that happened because the, i'll bet there are some especially back then there were a lot less scrupulous people with PhDs who basically mm-hmm. said, I'm going to say what I feel about any given subject and get it published by my buds at this journal. Right, yeah. It's it, it almost had, like, an Andrew Wakefield vibe to it, you know? Yeah, okay, I see that. So right off the bat, I hated him. And then it, it's a little more frustrating because... He's not a good person, but he's also kind of bland and just inoffensive for the rest of the book. Doesn't mm-hmm, really mm-hmm. do anything that suggests that he's an antagonist here. So I'm like, right. how am I... S- you give me this guy who's clearly pulling uh, the mother of all white privilege bullshit, and then he's a nothing character who's just there to expose it. So... Yeah, I think, like, part of me kind of enjoyed the fact that I was set up initially to think he was going to be the, like, main character, and then he wasn't. But I did have, I don't know, I feel like there's an air almost of, like, I don't want to say malicious, but if, you know, he's specifically described as going after specific people who, like, maybe went through some shit, and he winds up having to take what he can get in the end because only two people ever show up. Um, But I think that he contacts something like, I think a dozen initially. Um, And I, I guess it feels predatory to a degree. You know, I think that's the word I want where he is trying, he is purposely going and finding People who are maybe, I don't want to even say unbalanced, because that's not fair, but it turns out that might be true. Um, At the very least, he's trying to stack the deck for what is supposed to be like an objective analysis. Right. And going for people who already seem to have, to be inclined to believe in the supernatural and to have experienced it before or to for others to have told them that they have the ability to do it. Um, as in the case with Theo, where she was able to like, he chooses her because she had the ability to like get 90% of uh, the cards correct. When they had cards held up with their backs to her, she could tell you what, what card you were holding up. And she got like a really, really high percentage of them. Right. Well, I, was, I hope the person holding them up wasn't wearing glasses because that would explain uh-huh. a lot. Yeah. Um, well, I don't think, because later on in the book, Theo does seem to have some sort of connection, at the very least, with Eleanor. But Eleanor also feels like she's somebody that's easier to read than she knows. Right. Um. El- I, I feel bad for Eleanor. She's just, she's agreed. been dealt a really shitty hand. Her sister's terrible. We don't really learn about her mother. Yeah. Yeah, Eleanor Vance was 32 years old when she came to Hill House. The only person in the world she genuinely hated, now that her mother was dead, was her sister. She just liked her brother-in-law and her five-year-old niece, and she had no friends. This was spent. This was owing largely to the 11 years she had spent caring for her invalid mother, which had left her with some proficiency as a nurse and an inability to face strong sunlight without blinking. She could not remember ever being truly happy in her adult life. I mean, that is a really rough place to be living at. Yeah, Um, and I don't know. It's How can family members be so terrible to each other? Like, hey, you owe her the car. mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, she winds up having to basically steal it. 
And, of course, the first thing later on that her sister asks about is if the car is okay, not if her sister is okay. Um, and it was really gratifying that she wound up stealing it because I wasn't sure how that was going to go, if she was, like, going to buy a cab or something. Um, but she just is basically like, fuck you, and leaves, like, really early in the morning. Not before and... running over some poor old lady and her lunch. Oh, my God, that's right. And we get a real sense of her in that scene because she offers to, like, pay the woman for the things that she dropped and everything. Right. And it's um, it's nice character development, but didn't seem a little too much. A bit in detail, if you, got, if you see what I mean. Um, ordinarily, I might agree with you, but I just read a Stephen King novel last <laughs> month. And you know... <laughs> He loves to just get into so much this detail is, this about is a stuff nice that it turns out to not come matter. down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ease yourself yeah, off mean, the detail. You don't want to detox too quickly off unnecessary detail. So, it's this this audio book because I listened to it on audio book on YouTube, and then you asked me if you could borrow mine, and I didn't even have it, so I downloaded it from Audible because I had a credit. And then I listen to it, and it's a different narrator on Audible, and they're terrible. Uh, yeah, I was listening to her on 1.5, which uh, sounded normal. She is, I don't know, I didn't look up the name of the woman who did it, but I, like, I think it was a man who um, narrated it on YouTube, and it was fantastic. Like, I thought he was great. And once I started to listen to it on uh, Audible, I think I might return it. I'm just like, oh, I'm totally not listening to this again. Um, but yeah, I just really like, this was six and a half hours long or something, eight hours maybe. And you know, the Stephen King one had been like 35. So this is a very tight story, right. all things considered. Um, so yeah, Eleanor is, uh, is selected because she had had this weird thing happen where, her father died, and then after that, there were, like, rains of stones over her house um, that seemed to, like, come from nowhere. And people thought that it was, like, the ghost of her father or something. Um, which is just such a weirdly... Specific? <laughs> like... You know, like, why? Um and it says the stones continued intermittently for three days, during which time Eleanor and her sister were less unnerved by the stones than by the neighbors and sightseers who gathered daily outside the front door and by their mother's blind, hysterical insistence that all of this was due to malicious, backbiting people on the block who had had it in for her ever since she came. Uh, which... So was it just like a little sprinkling every once in a while or it was just constant pebbles raining down? So for three days you have a new driveway, you know, it, it, they said intermittently. So apparently it just like happened for like a, a couple minutes and then would stop and then would suddenly come back again with no explanation for three days. Okay. Yeah. I don't know how um, the neighbors could do that if they have really good lobbing hands to get it high enough to make it feel like it's <laughs> raining, but yeah, I am. I'm guessing that her mom was like an invalid at that point, so she couldn't go outside to see that this was probably impossible. So she just claimed, like, "Oh, they're just throwing stones at our house," and everyone else is like, "That's not what's hap like you. That's not what's happening." And she would just dismiss them and be like, "I know, I know that they're because that's this woman sounds just like my grandma. <laughs> my grandma believed that everybody was out to get her, and it was part of why she like couldn't hold a job and stuff." And even if it made no fucking sense, it was just, I think, easier for her to believe that, you know? And it didn't matter if the facts just straight up didn't line up. She, You would point that out to her, and she would just keep talking as if she hadn't heard you. It was not a factor for her at all. Um, Paranoia is a, of, a motif of this book. Yeah, most definitely. And she was a person that would really wear on you after a while because of this. So it makes so much sense how Eleanor is kind of broken by the time this starts because she has just fucking had it from dealing with this woman for, you know, the last two decades, basically. Um, and then there's Theodora. Her sketches were signed Theo, and on her apartment door and the window of her shop 
and her telephone listing and her pale stationery and the bottom of the lovely photograph of her which stood on the mantel the name was always only theodora theodora was not at all like eleanor duty and conscience were to theodora attributes which belonged properly to girl scouts theodora's world was one of delight and soft colors she had come onto Dr. Montague's list because going laughing into the laboratory, bringing with her a rush of floral perfume, she had somehow been able, amused and excited over her own incredible skill, to identify correctly 18 cards out of 20, 15 cards out of 20, 19 cards out of 20, held up by an assistant out of sight and hearing. So they weren't wearing glasses. They weren't even in like the room with her, right. apparently. So Theodora... Uh, she un like it's an unlikely sort of friendship, her and Eleanor. But you see later that basically they become friends because like what else are they gonna do? Right, Not they have no friends? like they can't be <laughs> friends with Doctor Montague or Luke because mm -hmm. men are terrible. Um, Theodora is, I don't, I feel like is this a manifestation of Shirley Jackson's crush in college? Because that's what it feels like to me. I mean, Theodora, it's, it feels like it's insinuated that she's gay, too. Uh, okay, I got that from the right. first page. It's like, oh, yeah. this woman is clearly queer. Yeah. But she's one of those, she's almost got this Manic Pixie Dream vibe where it's like, yeah, she's queer and everyone wants her, but you kind of can't have her because she's too free-spirited, you know? Right. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, I am. Um, I... F <laughs> All right, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Okay, so Eleanor steals her sister's car in order to go to the house because her sister doesn't want to let her, and she's just had it, basically, and has decided that she's going to finally live her life. And I really enjoyed this first little thing where she's driving to the house, and she's passing through all of these like quaint little towns, kind of like... Stuff that you would normally ignore if you were somebody who got to do this all the time. But because she doesn't ever go anywhere, it's all really exciting and new to her. And she actually, like, has little fantasies about houses that she passes and what it would be like if she lived there. And this felt very familiar to me. Um, what did you think of this? I've As someone who's done a lot of traveling, and I've, I was reminded... Of uh, this time, I was uh, a friend of mine was coming from California to visit uh, me in Connecticut, and we went to New York for the weekend to see the Lion King. And we get off the train, and I'm like, "Come on, we got to catch the subway." And he's just like standing there, right outside Grand Central Station, just staring at the buildings. And he's like, "Whoa!" <laughs> and I'm like, "Dude, don't! No, no!" <laughs> <laughs> he's being a tourist. Uh, it's it's just. Heart. It reminds me. It's. You, you don't know what to expect if you've never seen buildings like that, you know? So, mm -hmm. and just so tightly compacted that touch the sky. And that's kind of what I saw. I'm like, oh, wow, she's seeing other things for the first time because she never got let out, you know? This is something that I often wonder what it would be like to take Owen to New York because he has never been, other than visiting me in Connecticut, and I think he went to California with his parents once, but, like, not the city he hasn't been outside of oklahoma and texas really like he came with me in my to visit my mom in colorado in the suburbs and taking him to new york even philadelphia i just would love to see his reaction because i have a feeling he would be blown away a little bit and she like it the way that this transitions from perspective um I just want to read this paragraph. The road, her intimate friend now, turned and dipped, going around turns where surprises waited. Once a cow regarding her over a fence, once an incurious dog, down into hollows where small towns lay past fields and orchards. On the main street of one village, she passed a vast house, a vast house pillared and walled with shutters over the windows and a pair of stone lions guarding the steps. And she thought that perhaps she might live there, dusting the lions each morning and patting their heads good night. Time is beginning this morning in June, she assured herself. But it is a time that is strangely new and of itself in these few seconds. I've lived a lifetime in a house with two lions in front. Every morning I swept the porch and dusted the lions and every evening I patted their heads good night. And once a week I washed their faces and manes and paws with warm water and soda and cleaned between their teeth with a swab. 
Inside the house, the rooms were tall and clear, with shining floors and polished windows. A little dainty old lady took care of me, moving starchily with a silver tea service on a tray and bringing me a glass of elderberry wine each evening for my health's sake. I took my dinner alone in the long, quiet dining room at the gleaming table, and between the tall windows on the white paneling of the walls shone in the candlelight. I dined upon a bird and radishes from the garden and homemade plum jam. When I slept, it was under a canopy of white organdy, and a nightlight guarded me from the hall. People bowed to me on the streets of the town, because everyone was very proud of my lions. Like, whoa. She lets that just go flying right off the rails. It is a very detailed fantasy on her part. I really enjoy that it ends with, when I died, ellipses. <laughs> like, holy shit, she's planning her own funeral now. Um, and this happens a couple times. There's another like really cute little house that's like in a garden, and it's kind of in this nook. And she fantasizes about that. There's a, a spot where she passes a grouping of trees that are on the side of the road. And she almost wants to stop and get out and walk in through the trees. But she, you know, has to keep her appointment. So she keeps going. Little things like this that you wish to God she had just gone and missed her appointment by the end of this. Mm -hmm. Spoiler alert. This doesn't go great for Eleanor. Um... Uh, well, and... I mean, I don't know that I agree with that, because she's not doing great anywhere else. That's true. Like, there's nothing left for her. Um, yeah, that's true. Eleanor is just, it kind of feels like she was just doomed either way. And what I really like about this book, to kind of jump ahead a little bit, for me, it was a surprise that Eleanor's mental state really started to deteriorate the way that it did. Did you, like, see that coming, or did you know about that before you started reading it? Uh, no, I didn't know about that, but it became pretty clear to me early on that Eleanor was just not a reliable narrator. Mm -hmm. So I still don't really have any idea what was going on. <laughs> I'm like, did um, she, like, is she, there's a couple instances where I'm like, where the fuck did that come from? Like, that, that time where she gets super thirsty for Luke for some strange reason? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's uh, her relationship with Theo, which is very schizophrenic, and it very fits Theo, but at the same time, I'm like, okay, Theo says she's not interested in you coming to hang out with her, clearly... I mean, it would make sense for her to have some kind of, what's that personality thing that they say women can have where borderline personality disorder? Okay. That fits with Theo's character, but it also, I'm like, okay, did you imagine this really flirty friendship, queer, curious thing going on with Theo? Because I don't really put it past you because you're that desperate for affection. Yeah, I kind of, that was really where it was for me, was that I don't think she would have been averse to it simply because she didn't have anybody. You know, like, I think that she was taking affection wherever she could find it. Well, I, I started to doubt that Theo ever actually gave her any. That all that was in her oh, head. Oh, that it was all imagined? Interesting. Right. Okay. Um. So... What kind of started to set my alarm bells off, and I didn't really... Like, I realized that her perspective was skewed, but I didn't realize just how bad it was it, until, and I think that's part of the point, is that it isn't that bad until a little later. One of the moments when I really stopped and went, hold on a second, was when she's telling Eleanor, or Eleanor's telling Theo later about her little apartment that she has by herself. And I was like, I thought she lived with her sister. Right. And I like... Didn't even think about the fact that she was lying. I was thinking I mistook what I had heard earlier because I basically listened to the whole audiobook in like two days. So I stopped and was like, wait, I thought she lived with her sister. And then she talks about her cup with the stars on the bottom. 
And we had a moment with her when she stopped at this little diner and she has something to eat. And there's a little girl that won't drink her milk because it's not in her cup that has the stars on the bottom. And Eleanor later is talking about her little cup of stars. And I was like, okay, I know that wasn't her. So she is she just making stuff up? Why is she doing this? I, it's like, felt I got to me really like she, it started as her just kind of enjoying not being around her family mm-hmm. and not and sort of wanting to shut the terribleness of her life away and just not be that person for a little bit. It's very similar right. to how she was living in the houses. She's like, okay, here's some new people for me to meet and become friends with. I'm going to have a altered backstory for them so that I don't seem like such a mess, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I kind of um, I thought of this as new girl syndrome where this is something that I would fantasize about a lot when I was a kid because growing up in elementary and middle school I was like very withdrawn and um, afraid to express my opinions and like the my artistic side because I was convinced that I just wasn't very good at it and people were going to laugh at me and I would fantasize about getting to go to a new school where nobody knew me And getting to pretend that I had been cool at my old school so that I could suddenly step into that in this new place and nobody would really question it. And I feel like that's what Eleanor is doing is that she's like, I am, I am finally going somewhere where nobody knows that I have a terrible life and I'm kind of pathetic and I get to be whatever. And it's very freeing for her. Right. But it's just like, I didn't quite realize that that was because she doesn't think that to herself. There's never a moment where she's like, ooh, I'm going to get to do whatever I feel like here. She never actively has that cross her mind. She just starts telling stories to Theo. So that was what sort of threw me was that we are in her head, but it doesn't almost feel like she realizes she's making things up to a degree. There's an element of... Is she conflating memories because she's delusional? And I don't think that's actually true. I don't I think it like started that way. There's a tiny bit of it. Yeah, there's you know? a little bit of it, but she's she also has to convince herself, you know, right? That she's right. this whole different person. So of course she's not going to dwell in like I am making up this lie. Here mm-hmm. is the here are the pieces I'm going to put together so that I can successfully deceive these people. No, she's saying. I am a new person. There's going to be a little bit of fiction in here. I'm just going to run with it. And I think that's what made it so unnerving to me, because if she had thought to herself, oh, I'm going to do this thing and this will be fun. That implies a self-awareness about what's happening. But instead, she just starts doing it and it feels as if she isn't even quite aware she's made this choice and it's just happening now. Um, And then the other time she and Theo like get along great right off the bat. And then they start to really hit some strange moments when Theo believes Eleanor is doing all of the crazy shit that's happening around the house. And Eleanor gets really upset at the way Theo talks to her and insinuates all this. And at one point, they just like had a fight and and Theo's just like, I know I'm so sorry. I don't really think you did it. I can't believe I thought these things. And Eleanor's thinking, man, I would love to see you die. Yeah. And I remember it like I was listening to the audiobook and I just went, What? Like out loud. I was cooking when I was listening and I like stopped, looked at my speaker, rewound it by like a minute and listened to it again. And I was like, Okay, I guess that's how she feels now. Holy shit. And that was the moment when I was like, Okay, there is something going on now because I had just thought this was going to be a regular old ghost story and instead it's like a strange psychological thing happening too that I didn't I wasn't ready for and I wasn't looking for right um but yeah that that's just like oh I would love to see you die she like thinks about it in detail like drowning her or something what is it that she's like imagining I can't remember I can't remember either but it's that was the moment where I was kind of like okay you're clearly your perspective about Theo is off. And that's when I started to mm-hmm. question all of the girl bonding they had before. Like, was that real? Because 
We've already seen Eleanor is lying to herself and not a reliable narrator. So how much of right. was Theo just being nice to her when they were hanging out outside? Yeah, that's kind of like. And does she um, know that? That's that's what I was getting on, getting trying to pick up on because it's clear that Eleanor is not reliable to her own self either, mm-hmm. which means us as the audience don't know what is actually happening because Eleanor doesn't even. Mm-hmm. Regardless of any supernatural influence here, so. Um, wait, say that again. That so part? Eleanor is lying to herself and right. to these people, and because of the way the story is told, she's also lying to us. It doesn't require any supernatural influence to us for us to for me to think. Well, I can't trust anything this bitch is sh- saying. Right, right, right. To start off with, so. Yeah, it kind of makes you recontextualize what happened earlier, um, which I sort of liked. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking at the conversation where Theo's talking to Eleanor about everything and asking her about her history. Um, and Eleanor says, I sold the house. My sister and I each took whatever we wanted, small things. And then we sold everything else. Um, and my sister put her share into the bank and uh, for her little girl's education, I bought some clothes to come to Hill House. And then later on, she just invites herself to Theo's. And their, quote, friendship has pretty much deteriorated by that time. So it's a pretty weird thing for her to do and really gives an indicator of just how far gone she is mentally. Because Theo straight up is like, why do you want to come where you're not wanted? Right. And she's like, I'm not wanted anywhere. That's her response, which is fucking awful. Ugh. Ugh. I just felt so bad about that. Like, there's no self-pity in it when she says it. There's nothing about it other than fact. Like, well, where am I going to go? I'm not wanted anywhere. I have to go somewhere, so I may as well go with you. You know? Um. And I like that she gets weirdly obsessed over things. Like, she's thinking about how ugly her hands are one time. Oh, I forgot about that. And she keeps going back to it and being jealous of Theo's hands, which are beautiful and looking at how red her hands are and how old they look because she had to do so much like laundry and dishes and everything. Um, She just sort of circles around uh, obsessive little moments, you know, Um, there's just a lot of stuff like that, that, It crept up on me, and I think that's why so much of this was so effective, because the haunting itself feels very secondary once you get to the end of the story. But it does the haunting sort of sneaks up on them also. And so it's sort of like insinuated that maybe her mental state wasn't great initially, but being here sent her over the edge because there is a power in this house that latches on to whomever it is that doesn't have them like their mental defenses up, I guess. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I get that. It's, um, I just spent so much time like pausing and even taking some notes. All right, here's what happened at the house. Okay. And here's what they find in the book about who was there. And I'm trying to make these connections. Okay. There's a unhealthy sister relationship. Is the house making that, is it reliving this through Theo and Eleanor or is it sort of, is it Eleanor and Carrie? Like what's, what is going on here? And the only coherent think thing I can get out of the house is that it likes to gaslight women Mm -hmm. because it gives us the super detailed story of how the house became part of the Sanderson in the Sanderson's name. And I'm like, okay, well there's definitely some clues in here about what I should be watching out for. There's not. The only thing that really seems to matter is the fact that the house plays havoc with women. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I understand your frustration with that. And again, it's the thing that I liked about it. And, and that's <laughs> totally fair. It's just, I feel like, wait a minute, I put all this work in. Where's my payoff, <laughs> damn it? I'm just picturing, uh, what's his name, Charlie Day with the red string across the papers that are pinned to the wall. What's his name? The guy from... Uh, Always Sunny. 
Always Sunny, yeah. Yeah, I've seen that meme a lot. I don't know what it's in reference to. At least, I know but what the show is. that's how I is. picture you, like, trying to figure out what the hell is going on, and there's nothing. Um, yeah, I think, because I initially was doing the same thing, where I was trying to put things together, mostly because of the movie. Because in the movie, they turn it into that Eleanor was, that, that the house had been, like, an orphanage. Right. I think. And that Eleanor had grown up at the orphanage and been, like, abused. That is and so not my got memory. drawn back. Is that not it? That, I think it's – what happened was um, – I don't think it was an orphanage. I think the owner of the house was making the kids of the town work for him, and he killed a few of them. And his his second wife ran away while pregnant, and he is her – she is his descendant because of that. Okay. Um. And it's not okay, very clear so... in the movie either. It's just the whole point is, oh, it turns out that uh, she is the heir to the house and she's the only one who can stop the ghost. So, And she doesn't even... I mean, she does, but it's she has to get like absorbed into the house. Which makes no in order to do it. sense either. So No. She becomes like part of this mural on the door. Um, this carving. But... So I kind of expected there to be a connection historically with Eleanor because of the movie, which I can understand why the movie did that, but I feel like we're trying to think, what does this house want? And it's less about the house wanting something specific and more about the house being a like black hole for sanity. Okay. I'm you know what I mean? Sure. Like it just, and maybe it's not that something happened to cause it to be that way, but that, there's a, you know, the whole concept of feng shui. I've heard of it. Apparently it's about arranging your furniture so that it's not, so you don't trip over your shoes, I guess. It's it's meant to be a way of not only organizing furniture, but designing the interior of a house, if you have control over that, to uh, steer positive energies through the house without lots of obstruction and get negative energy easy access out of the house and you set mirrors in certain places so that you are avoiding uh reflecting positive energy out the window and losing it the whole idea is that the house is sort of like an ecosystem and the energy flow inside which is generated by the people who live there is like the beating heart and the energy flows through it like a circulatory system and so you want to organize the walls and the furniture and the uh, mirrors and things so that it flows smoothly and there are no blockages. In That's the general idea. I'm oversimplifying a lot here, but gotcha. The, there is a, um, there are a couple of houses in Japan and there have been some like documentaries on this that were built specifically to spit in the face of feng shui. Like, that they have done the 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 strange angles, and there, this is a thing that comes into play in Hill House, where the uh, measurements of the corners, which you know it's supposed to be a ninety degree angle, are just off enough that the entire blueprint of the house is thrown off. So you go around a corner and you expect to be at this certain spot, and you're not. You look out a window and you expect to see the room that you believe is across from this part of the house, and it's not there because you're actually in a different area. I like to think that he built this house in order to be like to make it into a curiosity and didn't realize that he was like fucking with some energy flows that he didn't understand and created this like vortex of evil, basically. For lack of a better word, it's I don't even like to call it evil because that feels too like absolutist. It's more just that if you aren't a stable person already, you're not going to be able to make it here. Have you heard of the Winchester Mystery House? Yes. So yeah, I've actually very similar idea. been there a couple times and they really downplay how crazy Lady Winchester was. Mm -hmm. uh, but you go through and it's... There's some there's some sinister stuff there. Like she had a séance room where she would pray. But there's no 
and she would sort of like there there was a window that would lead to this tiny like six by six room that you couldn't mm-hmm. go into and this is where she would do her praying to the spirits but also there was no floor she could hear what was going on in the kitchen she was basically spying on her servants there mm-hmm. yeah so they don't really play up how sinister the woman could be also she did like mm-hmm. terrible things like she would ride to town in her cart and she if she wanted to go shopping she would make the store keep grab the merchandise and bring it out to her because she didn't want to leave her wow yeah she was okay. just the worst and it's just it got me that kind of vibe you know here's someone who's got their head up their ass say i'm gonna build a house just for the fun of it and now it's a giant mess yeah, yeah, if it, like, I'm not, I don't know if that's supposed to be, I don't know what the takeaway, if she even had a specific one in mind when she wrote this, but I, je- I feel of the, about the house like it is a force, mm-hmm. not that it's necessarily wanting anything specific, but almost like the house in The Shining, where it just makes this man want to butcher everyone. There's nothing any, like, in particular, like, does the house need him to do that for it to continue on? And you don't get that impression. It doesn't, like, survive off the blood of innocence or anything. It's not like the house is going to crumble if he doesn't do this. But it just pushes him to. Right. And I, I just kind of have that overall, like, takeaway from it because we hear about, um, This other man who did the same thing, who was supposed to be leaving the house and drives into a tree and dies. And when that's presented to us in the book, it's made to sound as if the house wouldn't let him leave. Like it was a he was trying to escape and the house reached out and grabbed him and made it so that he couldn't escape. But when we are in Eleanor's head in those last moments... It's made to seem like she has gotten so desperately attached to this house that she doesn't want to leave until like the last instant of the book where she asks, why am I doing this? And then she hits, which I just loved that so much. Like she's doing it. She's heading for the tree. She's feeling like really good about it because now I don't have to leave. And then just before she hits she's going wait why am i and it's too late which is a really fucked up moment like if she kept driving if she managed to get away would her head clear would she be okay i don't know all of a sudden that's a good question so yeah that's i think that this is like a perfect storm of just people a person who um didn't have a lot to live for if you really like want to put it in the starkest kind of meanest terms um She didn't have a lot to live for. She was prone to flights of fancy, as they would say, and a house that preys on that, probably, to a degree. Um, And I wonder if she hadn't been there, if someone else would have wound up kind of falling victim to the house. If it, You know what I mean? That's a possibility. I kind of want to reread this book from Theo's perspective. Ooh, that'd be interesting just someone else who has another set of issues. Um, I'm just, I'm so, I'm so unclear of what was in Eleanor's head and what wasn't because the rest of the participants are just so blase about this weird, crazy shit happening that they just decide to not talk about anymore and not be affected by. Oh, see, I didn't get the impression they were blase at all. They seemed pretty freaked out by stuff. I thought. They did in the moment, but, Like, when they would wake up the next morning, and I forget when it was, but they have a conversation, and we're like, well, we're just, um, that's just the house. Mm -hmm. I think that, because there's a a bit of an emphasis on that. Um, Actually, the first time we have the emphasis is just the very next day, because the first day that they get there, uh, Eleanor pulls up, sees the house, and is like, oh, no, I do not care for this at all. Just the sight of the place is not okay. And she could barely make herself go in. 
Uh, Mrs. What's the name of the maid who manages? They call it? her Mrs. Dudley, but that's because they don't know her actual name because her husband's name is Dudley. That she is so hysterical. Jeez. I cannot get over. Oh my god, I want to find that spot in the book, but I'm having trouble because um I'm looking on my Kindle and it can be really hard. I should. There's like three it. different spots actually because she gives the same speech over mm-hmm. and over again and will not deal. With someone interrupting her and saying, like, hey, we know this. Like, it does not compute for her. Mm-hmm. So it made me wonder right off the bat, is she an apparition? Oh is God. she just a, a ghost that is sort of stuck in caretaking mode? Because it didn't even seem human that she could not not give her speech. That's, like, that's part of the the thing for me is, like, feeling like the house has drained away her sanity a little bit. And she still leaves at night. It's almost like the house, as awful as it is, there it makes you it makes people want to stay so that it can feed off them is kind of like the the theory I'm working on. So at night, it's all there's always something awful happening in the evening. And then during the day, everybody seems to feel great. So the day after, like, they're hearing knocking on the doors in the middle of the night after they first get there. In the morning, though, Eleanor's getting ready and looking in the mirror and thinking about how this is the happiest she's been in forever. And when she goes down to breakfast, everybody is in a downright cheery mood and wants to go out exploring. And all of a sudden, the house doesn't seem quite as threatening as it did. And I, I feel like it's... They're being lured, almost. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Um, again, this is all just conjecture. But I feel like the the really creepy stuff happens. They're scared in the moment. And then the... Because there's no way to kind of avoid them being scared by the weird shit that's going on. And then later on, the house is like... Oh no 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 no! Don't go anywhere. It's fine. It's fine. Just relax. We'll be. Co- It'll be cool. And meanwhile, it's like spiking your drink behind your back. Um, if you were taking notes, describe what some of the things are that happen to them while they're there. Like, do you have? There's the knockings on the door, and the big, the two big items that I felt just weren't really sort of dealt with, and again, this might be because it's Eleanor's perspective, were the blood all over Theo's room. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, that's that's when you call the cops, if there's blood everywhere. Yeah. And Eleanor's name is written. And there's no and, source for it. Like, they're just like, well, this is a lot. Where did this come from? And there's nothing. Like Right. And Theo, who at this point is kind of cold and weirded out by Eleanor. Mm-hmm is asked to sleep in her room. And I'm like, guys, guys, Mm -hmm. did you forget what has been going on here? (laughs) And Theo, why are you okay with this? I guess Theo just wants to be in the room with another human being. Like, because it feels so, I would want to be with a person, even if I that's fine. I wish, I wish they had said that because like, if the, if I woke up and my clothes and body and room were covered in blood and there was scrawled Natasha, you know the last person I want to spend the night with? Natasha. <laughs> so it was scrawled, like it was Theo's name. So are you saying that Eleanor should oh, not have Oh, it was? I thought it said Eleanor. I, th- I think it's Theo's name the first time. Okay. And then... I'm El- getting confused. Later on this- when it's like, help Eleanor go home. That's right. Okay. I'm her. getting I'm getting my events confused. And the other was when um, they go down to the brook and then there's a ghost picnic and a pack of hell beasts chase them. And then yes. Theo just like doesn't remember anything and see she seems kind of unaffected by it. In that she's uh, maybe she just doesn't trust Eleanor and doesn't talk with her about it, but mm-hmm. Eleanor also doesn't seem to really have any interest in figuring out what's going on. I'm like, guys, this this is where Dr. Montague's perspective would have been helpful because he's he would want he wants to record what happened and how are these things manifesting themselves and I don't really feel like lots of shit happens in this book 
and there's not a whole lot of follow-up, especially for a research mission, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I was actually going to bring that up in particular was the moment when they're, they stumble onto this, like, ghost picnic. Because I didn't, like, and this, Stephen King has called this book, like, one of the scariest books that he's ever read. Like, he loves it. And you really see moments that you know he was inspired by this and it reflects in a lot of his later work. And this is one of them is suddenly stepping into a scene in the past. Um, and they both see it, both Theo and Eleanor see it, but Theo yells at Eleanor not to look back at one point and they like run out of there, but they don't ever say what it was that Theodore saw. This actually, I read this, I, or I listened to the scene, and I paused it for a while. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, is the answer here that these people are gaslighting Eleanor, and the actual experiment is how crazy can we make someone? Ooh, that'd be messed up. Because I was like, that, I would have been really disappointed, but it just felt, that you see what I'm getting at? Like, there's a lot of things mm -hmm. going on, and you can feel Eleanor's state deteriorating, but... Montague and Theo, two people who really should have a lot to say on the matter, it doesn't really seem to come up again. Yeah, this... Um, so, I think the fact... I think the fact that they don't talk about it the way that you or I would talk about it, if something could that fucking nuts happen to us, was part of what creeped me out so much. That they seem to treat it as if, like, oh, well... That fucking thing happened, whatever. And it's not even worth discussing. And one could, you know, one could argue that Eleanor kind of has lost touch with reality by that point. Like, she's really starting to go down the path of imagining a lot of different things. And maybe Theo did go and talk to Dr. Montague, and that's just not part of the story that we see. Because Eleanor isn't really involved. Like, she's off in her own world by now. And we're just right. in her head along for the ride. So, I'm not convinced I, it is that it super hasn't unsat happened, unsatisfying, though. But yeah, it's. I think it's unsatisfying if you if that's your focus. If that if you want like the study of the house to be the thing, if you're more interested in that, then yes. For me, that was part of what was so unsettling is that Ellen like this weird thing happens. Eleanor seems scary in the mo scared in the moment, and then doesn't go and talk to Dr. Montague about it and sort of seems to, for lack of a better way of saying it, take it in stride that I guess I'm just going to wander into weird, like vignettes from the past when I walk around this house. And I don't understand, like, how do you not react in a more? And that was what kind of upset me about her. Um, so I think we just both like wanted different things. Um, well, it's, what I was specifically this. frustrated by was I never got to see, like, what specifically did Theo see? Mm -hmm. And that's something I felt, okay, that would be really cool to know, because at this point I'm not trusting what Eleanor is, say what is saying to me. So what does Theo have to say on the matter? And I think the next scene we see her is the scene where she says she wants to move in with Theo, and Theo's like, uh, no. Mm hmm and Theo's totally untraumatized by this giant thing that just happened. So I'm like, what is going on? Well, we don't, but we don't know that she's untraumatized. We just know that Eleanor isn't picking up on it if she is. That's fair. And Eleanor is not picking up on much by now. Because this woman's flat out telling her no. And Eleanor's like, yeah, so I figure I'll move down there in like two two weeks. Like completely ignoring so I think that's the the thing for me is that if we got more detail on what Theo's thinking, we'd have to jump from perspectives, right? I guess so. Or just have, you know, a conversation happen that Eleanor overhears. It's like, part of this is I find Theo a lot more interesting than Eleanor. Oh yeah, that's definitely fair. And, um, but do you know, we've only mentioned in passing is Luke. 
Yeah, what? Is there anything worth saying about this man? <laughs> Luke is technically the heir to the property, and he has to be here as part of the agreement with the family who owns it. Um, allowing That's fine. Dr. Why does Montague he have to be, to be in there? the book? Well, because I can't name a single character trait of his. Like the main thing about him is is that he's like a foil, and this is kind of great because so often in books like this, um, it's male characters, and there's a woman who's just there to be the prop for the two men to like fight over, and that's sort of what's going on with Luke is that. It's not even that Eleanor and Theo are really fighting over him, because as you pointed out, I really think Theo is queer, and I don't feel like Eleanor actually likes Luke. I think it's just, like, the theory of having someone who cares about her that is appealing to her. So he's just sort of there as, like, a another weird thing for Eleanor to grow obsessive over in a way that's inappropriate, uncomfortable to like watch happening. The moment when he's talking to her and she's trying to just have a conversation with him. And she realizes that he's like really arrogant and probably thinks he's charming, but she's not finding this impressive at all. And how abruptly Eleanor will go from really admiring someone to complete disdain and then seem to like let go of it. I find those moments to be really unsettling and I he doesn't need to be there. But Yeah, he is a plot device. I just Yeah. Honestly, I could not tell you I couldn't tell you like what his build is like, how old he is. I know he's a thief apparently and he's the heir to the house mm-hmm. and I I couldn't really tell you anything else about him. Oh, he plays chess, but we don't know if he plays any well yeah i think that like if i remember correctly he's blonde and like athletic like he's kind of you know the like a playboy type in mm-hmm. in theory but as it turns out he's not really like very good at it and he doesn't want this house there's a point at which they're talking about how they like they tried to sell it and nobody would buy it and he's saying oh and it's harder to burn a house down than you think which I thought was pretty funny. Um, he's trying- oh, I, I remember that now because when I when I heard it, I was like, "Oh, you're going as soon as this house is yours, you're going to set it on fire for the insurance money, mm-hmm. aren't you?" Mm-hmm. I really think he would too. And I'm I don't blame him. This is the right course of action because this place is ugly, and uh, the Dudleys don't even like it. I don't know who's been paying their salary all these years. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting kind of. Uh... She hates being there past dark. She's absolutely not going to be there after dark. But she's also really protective of the place. When they try to, like, you know, do things in a different way, put things in different places, open doors, close doors, she isn't having it. It's like the house has sort of possessed her in a way, and it knows that it's not safe there at night. So it's like, well, I'm going to get you safely out of here before I start my shenanigans. So you run on home. Because I need to put you to use again tomorrow, and I can't have She's you in the crossfire. She's the equivalent of a, a vampire day driver. Yeah, right. She's the, she's the uh, what's his name that eats the bugs? What's the one? Eats the bugs. Yeah, Dracula's like assistant that eats oh. the bugs. Igor. No, Igor. I don't know. I've never I've never read Dracula. I haven't either. Um, but it, he was in Penny Dreadful. Um, there are people yelling at me that are so mad right now. Renfield. Renfield. Okay. Um, I haven't seen Penny Dreadful either, but I have seen some vampire, some modern day vampire tales where like they hang out in the trunk all day and they have a human drive them around and then at night they can come out and do their shit, you know? Yeah. That's what basically the Renfield is like a human, um, servant who's like kind of compelled to do favors and take care of the all of the business of this vampire during the day. And I think that's kind of her deal is that she's somehow compelled to do this. And I really feel like if something were to happen to the house, she'd kill herself. Like, I think that's the end of her life there. Okay. Well, that's sad, but this house kind of needs to go. So Mm -hmm. there's not a whole lot left of Mrs. Dudley to mourn. (laughs) That's true. It does seem like she's kind of a shell of a human being at this point. Um, so should we talk about our favorite character? Which one? Who's um, yours? Is it is it Theo? No, it's Mrs. What's it? Mrs. Montague? Oh my God, his wife. 
<laughs> I'm so mad at this book for having this great character show up so late. Because <laughs> I was like, uh, this is another frustration of mine. Because when she shows up, I'm like, yes, yes, this is amazing. I want to read so much more of this. And then I realize I'm in chapter eight of nine. So I'm like, oh, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> Uh, yeah, Mrs. Montague is basically her the way that her husband frames it is, well, she's a really good wife. She takes excellent care of me and she only really has one vice and that's supernatural bullshit. No, so. she's got two. She's got that weird armed boyfriend she keeps around. Oh, yeah. The professor <laughs> who's like toxic masculinity personified. Exactly. Um, and I, I clearly got the sense that they were lovers. Oh, see, I didn't think that. I got the sense that she was too fucking uptight for to, to ever be like have an impropriety like that. But that she and him were like in love with each other, and so they just spent all their time together. And she emotionally got what she wanted from him, but that they never ever like took it to a physical level. Okay. Uh, that's that's possible. Um, it's it's just it's so clear to me that she does not respect her husband at all. Oh God, no! Nor should she. She's so much smarter than him. I mean, he's doing this like when she comes in and she's just like, "Well, you haven't done this and that," and he's getting really irritated. And I'm like, "Yeah, though you st-, like he's trying to act like he's above what she's deciding to do with the planchette." And I'm like, you're here to ghost hunt, dude. You're not better than her. What you're doing least, isn't more elevated than her. At least the planchette, like, leaves a record. Mm-hmm. You know, here's some evidence you can actually point to. This is also a scene that's clearly influential for King. Yes. Because yeah, you true. have not you have not read The Stand, but there is a planchette in The Stand. Oh, okay. crazy-ass shit. So, I personally... Just for efficiency's sake, use a fucking Ouija board. Yeah, Because agreed. it takes time for the swinging pen to write all this shit, and of course all the letters are connected, and what if they need to go to the next line on the page and it's going to scratch out everything before it? Like, <laughs> it's we, Nobody writes anymore. Type it. And Ouija board is the ghost equivalent of typing. That's so. funny. It's the new instant messenger. Um... Yeah, although I, you can't you can't do emoji on a on a Ouija board. Oh my god, they should add emojis to Ouija boards. How fucking funny would that be? Oh, somebody do that, please. Um, <laughs> it'd be so much faster too. Um, so yeah, she doesn't have any respect for her husband, but it doesn't seem like he has respect for the thing that he claims he's doing here. So it's hard to really like feel any sympathy for him getting irritated at her. And she comes, like, she comes out of that library with more information in an hour than he's right. gotten the whole time that they've been there for three days, I think, before she arrives or something. So it apparently is worth it. Hi. She's getting something done. And he's still really disdainful of her. Um, despite her, I feel, proving herself. But, you know, I totally agree. I mean, she's a wacko, but at least she's doing something. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And she uh, gets there's a moment when so Eleanor. You have these moments where like her, her name is written in what looks like it could be blood in the hallway. I don't know if they ever confirm that that's what it is, but. Everybody's sort of looking at her, wondering if she has done this herself and starting to act a little strange around her because now they're thinking maybe she's not okay. And finally, we get to see firsthand that she's not okay because she is out in the middle of the night wandering around people's bedrooms, like knocking on the doors and running away. And finally, there ha- was a one of the sisters killed themselves in like this bell tower i think is it right. bell tower and she climbs up there but... oh I, actually i think it's i think the library is on the tower wait what that's maybe i misunderstood but i thought the trap there's a trap door there's multiple ways to get into the library 
Okay. And one of them is a trap door that leads down to the staircase that they don't use because that's where she killed herself. Okay. And the staircase is that they don't use is really rickety and run down. Right. And that's what Luke has to climb up to, like, save her from herself because she has climbed up there in this sort of fugue state, clearly intending to kill herself. And gets sort of snapped out of it once everybody finds her. And they do not think that it's possible that she's been kind of possessed. It, it doesn't seem to have occurred to any of them that that's what's going on here. They're all just flat out mad at her. Because they feel like, oh, you were probably the one that wrote your name on the wall. And now you're going to do this thing. And you just want attention. And oh, get over yourself. Is pretty much the attitude of all of them. Right. And Luke is, like, real pissy that he has to climb up there and save her because he's not a real courageous guy. And I don't think if – is it Albert? Is that her, her – um, I think it's Arthur. Arthur, okay. Um, but if he – if Arthur hadn't been there to sort of judge him, I'm guessing Luke would not have climbed up there. Well, I – I kind of can't feel too bad for Luke because at this point everyone's like this bitch. Right. True. Like Arthur has not seen the Eleanor drama of the last few days. Um. Yeah. So he he like is yelling at her. He's got her kind of over his shoulder, and he's whispering to her that like if you get me fucking killed, I swear to God, like he's just so mad at her. Which I found so funny for some reason. It just felt really incongruous with some of the other, from the mildness that we see directed toward her most of the time. Even when people are suspicious of her, they seem to be suspicious of her with the caveat that they think she's not in her right mind. So we're going to be gentle at the same time. And Luke just doesn't have time for that. He's just irritated and he doesn't care if she's not in her right mind. Just knock it off, lady. I'm going to, you're going to kill me and I'm not here for this. Um, so that really is kind of the climax, so to speak, that causes them to decide that she needs to leave. Um, the doctor, after everything, has decided that the house is getting to her. And it's not like he thinks that's the point. Like, I think it is. I think... You came here to see what this house is capable of and what's going on here, and you're seeing it. And now you're trying to stop it because you, it's, like, unsafe. Well, no shit, it's unsafe, dude. You've had two people kill themselves here that you know of. Of course it's probably unsafe, but he doesn't seem to, like, really take... He doesn't seem to really even think that's a possibility, I think, is the main frustration for me. It doesn't even seem to enter his mind that what's happening with Eleanor is evidence of exactly what he seemed to be looking for, you know? Um, And so he wants to send her away. Eleanor is, like, weirdly kind of passive about it until it comes time to, like, get her to get in the car and drive away. Right. And that's when she starts to be like, hold on, wait, no, I'm not leaving what? This is my house, if anything. She's like, the house wants me here. I'm not going. And they make her, and that's when she's like, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll never have to leave if I just drive into this fucking tree and die. And that is what she does. And yeah. this is pretty And she questions surprising. why she's doing it. We've already talked about that. But... Yep. No, I kind of saw that coming. It's, I don't think there's any way Eleanor gets out of this. Yeah. Well, and like when I say, I I won't say that I saw it coming because I feel like that implies that I knew she was going to kill herself. And that's not what I mean. I thought that it was going to be something like that awful movie where she like maybe goes down a hallway or in a door and it turns out. There's no door out. Something that causes her to be trapped in this house forever. Right. And just something as simple as killing herself and and via a modern means, too. It's not like she slit her wrists or hung herself. She's in a car. 
which just gives the whole thing a different sort of of tone. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That just really caught me by surprise. By the time she was leaving, I felt she was leaving. And that if she came, I, I, if anything else were to happen, it would be because she snuck back to the house on her own, like in the middle of the night, you know? Um, so I'm just going to read this last bit because this is, I just think it's so well done. They waved back at her dutifully, standing still, watching her. They will watch me down the drive as far as they can see, she thought. It is only civil for them to look at me until I'm out of sight. So now I am going. Journeys end in lover's meeting, which is something that she thinks of over and over and over throughout the book. But I won't go, she thought, and laughed aloud to herself. Hill House is not as easy as they are. Just by telling me to go away, they can't make me leave. Not if Hill House means me to stay. Go away, Eleanor, she chanted aloud. Go away, Eleanor. We don't want you anymore. Not in our Hill House. Go away, Eleanor. You can't stay here. But I can, she sang. But I can. They don't make the rules around here. They can't turn me out or shut me out or laugh at me or hide from me. I won't go. And Hill House belongs to me. With what she perceived as quick cleverness, she pressed her foot down hard on the accelerator. They can't run fast enough to catch me this time, she thought. But by now they must be beginning to realize. I wonder who notices first. Luke, almost certainly. I can hear them calling now, she thought, and the little footsteps running through Hill House and the soft sound of the hills pressing closer. I'm really doing it, she thought, turning the wheel to send the car directly at the great tree at the curve of the driveway. I am really doing it. I am doing this all by myself now, at last. This is me. I am really, really doing it by myself. In the unending, crashing second before the car hurled into the tree, she thought clearly, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Why don't they stop me? Yeah. And then... That pretty much uh, signs the death warrant of the rest of this experiment. Her dying, everybody's just like, and we're done. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. Um, yeah, part of me wants some sequels told from the perspectives of the other women who lived there, like the the companion and the sister. You right, know. yeah. <laughs> Dr. Montague finally retired from active scholarly pursuits after the cool, almost contemptuous reception of his preliminary article analyzing the psychic phenomena of Hill House. You think? Ugh. Uh, I, I, I'm glad there was some comeuppance for this boring asshole. So. <laughs> I just love that it's like you can almost hear the air quotes around scholarly pursuits like it ever was that. Come on. Um, so yeah, I, I think what appealed to me so much in general was just how much this snuck up on me. I went into this really thinking it was going to be, here are a bunch of regular people in a haunted house and the ghost is doing stuff and oh my God, are we going to die? We have to save ourselves. And as it turns out, it's a bunch of regular people in a haunted house. And one of those people is slowly not being a regular person. And you don't quite realize that's happening until they've pretty much gone over completely. And even once it has happened, everyone around them hasn't realized it's happened yet either. Until it's dangerous, frankly, for all of them to be around her. Like, I just wonder what would have happened if they hadn't tried to force her to leave. Because... I guess she could have just killed herself in that bell tower like she had been gonna. But it and it does seem like the house isn't so much interested in making people act out in violent ways. It's pretty much been people killing themselves. Right. It's not it doesn't seem to like violence committed against people. It's just driving people over the edge and right. letting them harm themselves. Um and Hill House by the end of the book is just sitting there the way it always has. Which, somebody needs to knock that shit down. <laughs> well, I'm sure Luke will get around to it. So Probably. I was afraid, like, his his solution to burning the house down, clearly through the insurance money, and I I was like, yeah, this is a good solution mm-hmm. to the problem. Thanks for thinking this. Um, and I'm glad he didn't die like he did in the movie, so that he could carry out his plan later. Yeah, doesn't almost everybody die except for Eleanor in the movie? 
No, it's like it's Luke and Eleanor who die, and Theo and the Doctor are found the next morning outside by the gate oh. by Mrs. Dudley. Yeah, it's it's the stakes are super low because it's Luke is Owen Wilson, so who gives a shit? Oh my and, god, is he really? Yes. Jesus Christ, I did not remember that at all. Oh, and it's hysterical. The Doctor also has terrible research methods because he um, he's doing a study on group fear. So he takes them to a haunted house. Mm-hmm. But he doesn't tell them that's what he's doing. He says it's for insomnia. Oh, okay. And has all of three subjects. One of them is Catherine Zeta Jones being a Brooklyn artist, Owen Wilson being Owen Wilson, and Eleanor on some some really like powerful SSRIs because she just floats through this movie like a kid wearing a Disney princess costume and she's always smiling and it's just super weird. Hmm. Especially since it does not play up the insanity part of Eleanor at all. Yeah. Cause I remember in the movie thinking that she seemed like she was acting really off, but then they basically try and explain that rather than have it be like, Oh no, she's losing her marbles because some shit's <sighs> happening here. That's not, I okay. think the answer is Lily Taylor's the only one who read the book. Mm hmm. Oh yeah, uh, and Liam Neeson was the was the doctor too. Yes, I think that was part of why I went to see it was that <laughs> Liam Neeson because I had the biggest crush on him. Um, so yeah, I think that might be part of why I was like, oh, I'm totally gonna go see this scary movie with Liam Neeson, and Catherine Zeta Jones was in it, and I kind of liked her. And uh, there's somebody in the very first scene that winds up like having to leave because a harp tightens itself. No, she's she's. It's his two assistants. Okay. And one is male and one is female. And the woman says, there's something in this house. She, like, totally has a freak out. And she says it's here. It's in the piano. And she rakes her fingernails across the piano strings. And one of them snaps and hits her in the eye. And her, the other assistant takes her to the hospital. And that's the last we see of them. Oh, okay. So, yeah, there's, like, a super lot of nothing happens in that movie. And combined with Lily Taylor being so giddy and manic and smiley all the time, I'm like, this is not a horror movie. This isn't even a movie. This is just Big Brother with famous people, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true, actually. Um, so, yeah, in summary, don't see the movie, guys. But Well, I've, I've heard good things about the 1960 version, but unfortunately, as I was telling you before... The, the sleazy streaming site that I tried to watch it, like, it would give you two seconds of video, and then it would have to buffer for another three seconds. <laughs> so I was like, no, this is not worth it. Um, I really need to watch, I want to watch the old one of this, and I want to watch the old one of, um, oh my god, Rebecca. Because Miles just, like, loves that movie so much, and he kept being like, you need to watch it, you need to watch it, come on. Uh, so yeah, I want to do both of those. I need to do Cloud Atlas, I know. So there's, um... the other one? There was another one that was made into a movie. Fucking, I know that Bag of Bones was made into a movie, but I'm not watching that. No, not you're not. Like, I told you, I did not realize that I had, I was reading the book of a movie I had seen until the very end. Because it was so immemorable. Um, that's, that's like, so, uh, that's basically, yeah. I do, I do want to talk about the kind of generation gap because there was another mov- movie that what got remade around the same time and that was House on Haunted Hill. Oh God! Right, so that had Tay that Diggs so and bad. Allie Larder, and I had a massive crush on Tay Diggs, but I was uh, since I was in the closet, I was pretending I had a massive crush on Allie Larder, so that's why I liked the movie. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, it was super terrible, but of course, being 19 years old, I was like, yes, blood and guts, grossness, and Fam K. Jansen showing her tits. Let's do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a couple months ago, I saw the original version. And it's a lot more slower paced, and a lot less happens. There's really, like, only one death and one event. Mm-hmm. So it's that's where I started to pick up. It's like, oh, this whole horror trope of either a like the zombie road trip where people slowly get picked off one by one and you're wondering who's going to survive or b the people are trapped and of course people 
falling one by one is kind of a recent invention. So I don't think that kind of trope in horror existed before right. the late 70s and early 80s. Except for like, and then there were none by Agatha Christie, which is specifically oh, like a mystery novel and not a horror thing. So it existed, but it was not the baseline of what all horror was. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, actually, and that reminds me, there's a, uh, a kind of theory that I've seen put out there that maybe Eleanor is like, has telekinetic ability and that that is why there were stones falling on the house when she was like a kid and her father had just died mm -hmm. and now she was stuck with her crazy mom was that she was causing that to happen with her own, like her distress, you know? without even realizing it. And so that ability manifests again in the house. And that's how the, her name appears on the walls and stuff. It's like, she's doing it without even being there. So um, some 11 type shit going on a little bit. Yeah. Which I think is pretty interesting. Like I kind of like that idea that this is the reason that she was brought there is because she had weird shit happen. And that is exactly what continues to happen. Only the person who thought he knew why, is he was unprepared for what that was really going to turn into. Cause how could you predict that? Right. Um, so that's yeah. interesting. I don't have any fan theories of what was going on. I just, um, I don't know. I did not find as, as interesting as the mental degradation of Eleanor was, I did not find Eleanor herself that interesting. I found her very tedious. I think that's fair. I didn't really find her interesting either. It was trying to decode what was actually happening around her through her weird, like, fucked up haze of a perspective that I found interesting. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it, it, it just felt, it felt a little like a me. It felt a little bit to me like a dance with dragons. Like, at this point, I was so frustrated with her. Like, yeah, there's shit I need to know and figure out. But God, why do I have to sit through her fucking this another Daenerys chapter? You know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um. So it's I. I really did not like her by the end of the book. Oh and no, no, she's she is so, not. She's barely likable to start off with when she's just kind of sad and pathetic. Mm -hmm. She's not really likable, and then she just starts to turn like, and she's thinking about how much she'd like to see certain people die, like. She's not a good person in a lot of ways. Um, I, yeah, I, I just, I found, I think I, I think really for me, the whole idea of unreliable narrators is something that I haven't explored a lot as a reader. There aren't a lot of books I've read that have been this overt in trying to kind of confuse the reader. Mm -hmm. When it's been an unreliable narrator before, it's been, you know, like somebody who's just like, you're reading from the perspective of a racist or an abuser or somebody who's just a bad person. And you still mm -hmm. get a pretty clear sense of what's happening. You just have to hear their thoughts on it first. But what's happening is like, you're getting a, a, an objective report. It feels like despite their slant and bias on it. And this was like unreliable and not, it wasn't clear it was unreliable initially. And then when it becomes clear, it feels like she's just spacing out and missing conversations or things that are going on around her. And so you're trying to like, and that was what I found really interesting. Cause I don't think I have a lot of examples that I can, I can't even think of one right now of reading something like this, where I felt like I, I kind of wanted to push Eleanor out of the way to see what was happening but that was what I liked about it. And okay. that is the opposite of what you liked about it. So <laughs> Yeah, I just I felt really frustrating with me. Like there's all this investigation I want to do into what's going on, but it means I have to put up with Eleanor and her bullshit mm -hmm. to get the information I need. And I sort of just I really resented her for it, you know? Mm hmm That's fair. Um all right, well I think that's about it. Yeah, again? that is good. So what are we reading next month? Next month is um, Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wynne-Jones. Oh, okay. So, I've heard a lot about that. It's an so, anime also. So there goes another that's thing. That's why Candace wants it. Should, right? Yeah. Um, 
I have a lot of people who really enjoyed this, and they apparently put the anime in theaters again, uh, like, last month, and my friend really wanted me to go, and I was like, I can't. I need to, I have to read the book for the book club. I can't go see it. Sorry. Um, so it's a pretty popular one and it seemed to have the vibe of the, the most like nostalgic, friendly sort of vibe of the books, which is why I picked it for December for, you know, the Christmas time. Gotcha. You know, it just felt like I wanted something a little bit comforting, I guess, around then. Um, so yeah, Howl's Moving Castle will be coming up next. And then for 2018, I don't know yet. So guys, if you have ideas of things that you want me to cover, if you're a patron in the patrons group, I already posted that question. I will pin that to the top of the group to make it easier to find. And I've asked people, what should I cover? And also in the book club group, I have asked the same thing. And if you are a patron, um, on Patreon, I will be narrowing down what people commented with based on how many likes they got and presenting some options in a poll. And uh, as you can see in the perks on Patreon, depending on how much you pledge, your vote gets counted multiple times. Um, so I'm going to so lay down some rules in as well, because I've, I've been on that and I've seen a couple people post in trilogies. So, Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I feel like I've made that clear multiple times, but people just don't like to listen. So single one-off books only, guys. Very simple. One-offs. No trilogies, no series. Not doing it. Um, I mean, if there's a book that you feel like really stands on its own and it happens to be part of a series, but you don't feel like the rest of the series is necessary, like Dune, then that's fine. You know, I just did Dune and I didn't feel the need to do any more. I sure fucking do. <laughs> Not many Not people like do. Ugh. But um, if you really are like, I really think you should read all three of these, it's not happening. I'm just going to tell you that right now. So, yeah. Single books. And I don't have a problem covering something because really originally the first uh, year and a half that I've done this, I wanted to read books I hadn't read yet. And... I'm still mostly interested in books I haven't read, but if there's the occasional one that gets brought up that's something I have read and I could find a co-host who hasn't, that'd be fine. It just has to be something that's compelling enough for me to want to cover it again, you know, to read it again and talk about it. So, um, so yeah, if you are not a patron, go to uh, facebook.com slash group slash unspoiled book club. And if you are a patron, you know where that group is. And you should uh, leave a comment letting me know. Make sure to read the other comments, too, because people will, like, totally post the same thing as somebody 10 comments above them because they didn't bother to read through. And that drives me bonkers because it's hard to assess how much people are interested in a certain title if it's been mentioned a few times and their likes get sort of split up. And I kind of go off of how many people have expressed agreement or interest in that book by the likes they've given to somebody's suggestion um so yeah read read comments before you suggest stuff don't suggest trilogies don't suggest series and um that's about all the rules i can think of for that is there anything you want to add yes uh is this should be coming out it's probably pretty close to thanksgiving by now so those of you who are in the la area why don't you come out day after thanksgiving and go to lost con where you can see bitches and money live where we will be covering rogue one which i haven't seen yet also, Lost Con is an excellent time to be had by all. And if you like the sound of my voice and you like me uh, bitching about poor choices, you can hear me on Unscrupled with Bitches and Money, where we cover Buffy slash Angel here on the Unspoiled Network. Yay! Um, yeah, guys. Also, uh, we're going to be coming up on next year. I'm going to um, be doing Westworld with Rashawn. So... That's a new series that's going to be coming out in a couple of months. It's crazy that it's fucking almost mid-November at this point. Um, yes, that is the one so yeah, series I've managed. So much. That is the one series I've managed not to watch while waiting for you to cover it. So, what Westworld? Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, really excited about it because Rashawn's excited about it because she loves it, and it's always fun to cover stuff that Rashawn like is in love with because she gets so geeked out. Um, so anyway, guys, thank you so much for listening, for supporting the show. 
Um, make sure to leave us a review on iTunes if you get the chance. And that's a really easy way to support the show without having to spend any extra money. But if you are interested in spending extra money and getting access to some other bonus content, you can go to patreon.com slash unspoiled and pledge whatever you like. Um, there's all kinds of different tiers and rewards on there based on how much you pledge. And also, you can shop on Amazon at unspoiledpodcast.com slash Amazon. Use our link and uh, it gets I get a little cut of it, but you just pay what you would normally pay shopping Amazon. So it's like a painless way to support the show. So do that. Bookmark the link. Use it every time. And it will really add up for me and be a big help um, offsetting the cost of doing the show. So I think that's everything. Um, all right, everyone. Thank you again. Hope that you all had a lovely Halloween and that you have a lovely Thanksgiving by the time the next episode goes up. We're going to be into December, the second week of December, because we have our trip coming up at the end of the month to Universal Studios. So I won't be doing the first Saturday in November or, or the first Saturday in December recording like I normally do. I usually do first Saturday of the month for book club, but that's going to be put off a week because of the trip. So uh, it'll be up a little bit later in the year. And... I hope that you guys have a lovely uh, Thanksgiving. And if you aren't from the U.S., whatever it is that you do on the th the third thanks uh, the third Thursday of November. <laughs> Nobody else like what a weird thing for us to do. We're just like, well, you know, this day of the week in this week of the month, instead of it just being a day of the month, like Christmas is, you know. I kind of wish we did that with Christmas and just had it be on a Friday every year instead of a like dumbass Monday. I'm a big fan of the um, make every month 28 days. Oh, so. yeah. And then be 13 months. It'd be so much easier. Don't and get then you have, on you have one day. New Year's, th New Year's Day is not any day of the week. Also, uh, leap year is Halloween, too. Wait. I'm not asking questions. We need to cut this off, but okay. you're a madman. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening, and we will see you next month with Howl's Moving Castle. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Bye. Spoiled Network Podcasts.